Our presentation this morning is really about the practical selection of alloys and alternative materials like ceramics. Uh, I'm with Inex. We're involved in silicon, silicon carbide composites. We'll talk a little bit about that in relation to metal alloys. But I really want to keep the talk at a level of, hey, you know, we're all in this business where we use trays and fixtures and belts and all sorts of alloy components, which particularly in carburizing, the most common heat treating process, are subjected to very high temperatures and corrosive factors. Carburization itself, exactly what we're trying to do with the metal that we're heat treating, is affecting all these alloys that were, you know, standing, you know, carrying, uh, loading our furnaces, uh, the radiant tubes, uh, the belts, of course, I mentioned. Uh, you know, these things are being affected um, to a greater extent because it's repetitive, you know, almost sometimes continuous 24 7 type exposure to the carburizing environment, endothermic or other. Okay, bottom line is a lot of excess carbon in there that these alloys are seeing over time. Okay, the other thing is some of these, uh, there's some exposure to oxidation when the furnace is opened hot or and the material uh, and materials are loaded or unloaded. And in the case of radiant tubes, the interior of the radiant tube is essentially exposed to some amount of oxidation all the time due to the excess air that the combustion burner is operated at. So if you got five or ten percent excess air, typically you got, let's say, one or two percent oxygen uh, exposure to the inside of that tube. And uh, so we're going to talk about essentially how alloys respond to these corrosive effects and then move on okay to talk about the alloys uh, themselves in terms of their mechanical thermal mechanical response to what's happening okay in terms of creep and distortion and things of this sort so uh, and these are the headaches that we all live with in atmospheric carburization all the time there's no way around it at least at this point in time and if uh, well, you hear of things out there on the horizon, but they aren't here yet. We're talking about a practical real world that's here today. So we are now trying to get on with the show, and we're going to try to have a little bit of uh, discussion, uh, as we already have, about defining the problem in carburization. We're going to talk about atmospheric corrosion specifically. We're going to talk about creep stress. This is short term creep okay so we're measuring the amount of stress that it takes oh that's not the right button okay that's the right button so we're talking about a very small amount of creep that occurs in a very short period of time what's the stress to make this amount of deformation take place in this very short period of time and then we're going to move on and talk about creep rupture okay this is actual failure and we're talking about the amount of stress that it takes to rupture uh, the material, okay, at 10,000 hours. Well, what's 10,000 hours? Let me do the math. Um, one and a third years, something like that, okay? 1.4 years, I think. Okay, so, uh, and that's a very relevant period of time. We'd like our alloy basket, our tray, our belts to last longer than this. Uh, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. What can we do about it? I guess another point that I'd make here in terms of everything that I've come down to on the agenda so far is that every one of our processes is a little bit different. Okay, The metallurgist has concerns in meeting the customer's uh, specifications. Uh, we have different pieces of equipment. Some of these equip pieces of equipment are very sensitive in terms of you know, all the thermodynamic considerations and such the academics would uh, uh, put it, clue us into. But, uh, you know, your problem is probably different than the problem of the gentleman sitting next to you, okay? Or the lady, forgive me, okay? Um, because your process is probably what you're trying to do, the geometry of your parts, 
uh, the conditions that you're operating at are a little bit different. So I am not here to, to suggest that in this imperfect world there's anything like a universal solution. Okay? What we're going to talk about are the things that we have to look at that you have to look at in your specific situation to, uh, to do the very best you can in terms of alloy life, cost, uh, reducing downtime, not losing a load. Uh, you know, it can result in thousands of dollars of damage when you eventually were to have, you know, a rupture. You want to avoid that. And then we're going to talk finally a little bit about uh, load stress. You'll have to forgive me. We come at this. Uh, I'm not an operating heat treater. Many of you are, okay. Uh, you know, we come at this from the radiant tube side. And radiant tubes uh, tend to be some of the more aggressive service components in the furnace. The delta T of a radiant tube has to be higher than your process temperature to transfer that heat radiantly uh, into the process environment. And, uh, and because of that, they're operating at higher temperatures than what the other service components, the belt, you know, your trays, your baskets. And because of that, there's more stress. And we'll just look at that stress situation. And now we go on to this, uh, well, this very um, annoying pile of scrap material. Those are radiant tubes, you know. And uh, this is an actual photograph from a heat treating uh, facility. And this is the type of headache that we're talking about. Now, you can imagine that those are trays, that those are fixtures. They could be cast. They could be fabricated. But we're all dealing with these problems where we're losing, where the service life of alloys uh, is less than what we'd like it to be. And it costs more than what we'd like them to cost. What can we do about it? What can we do better than what we're doing now? Um, there's not a lot of information out there about service life, of uh, actual service life of uh, alloy components in heat treating, uh, in carburizing. But this GRI study, and you can tell that that's dated right off by the fact that I'm, I'm supposed to be hitting the center button. <laughs> GRI is the Gas Research Institute. Okay, some of us barely remember when the Gas Research Institute uh, existed. I think. Uh, they disappeared uh, in the mid-90s or so. But in any case, uh, maybe it was the late 90s. But anyhow, they did this study where they surveyed the heat treating industry and tried to get some idea of radiant tube life. Okay, I'm sorry I don't have information on other uh, service components, uh, you know, trays, baskets, belts, whatever. But uh, they found that about uh, upwards of 20% of the tubes were lasting less than a year. Okay, over 30% were lasting between one and two years. Okay, here again above 20% in the second, between the second and third year. And then some of them, I'll say, were getting relatively decent alloy performance service life out here at three to four and excellent out here at four to five years. Okay, uh, of course, some of these radiant tubes are being used at relatively low temperatures. Okay, relatively low, well, what am I talking about? Well, they might be used in nitriding or nitrocarburizing, but as you get to carbonitriding and then into carburizing itself, you're moving down into this area where you got relatively short life. And, uh, and this is the kind of problem, again, and you're going to have the same problem, you know, cast fabricated belts, you know, uh, all sorts of baskets and whatever that you're using, okay? Again, very individualized in terms of your process conditions and even the components, the design of the mechanical components, a cast tray that you're using, okay? So, um, why consider change? You know, this is sort of the story of the person who walks into your shop and says, uh, you know, I want a job, you know, I've, uh, I've been in heat treating for 20 years, I have all this experience. Well. Maybe one of the things you as an employer have to look at is, well, does that person have 20 years of experience or do they have 20 years of one year's experience, or what I should have said, do they have one year of experience repeated 20 times, okay? And this is the situation we are with our alloy components. 
So uh, this is attributed to uh, Albert Einstein, sometimes others. Definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And unfortunately, a lot of us are sort of stuck in this loop, okay, and it's hard to get out of it, okay. How can we basically make better design, better alloy selections, and essentially achieve better results, you know, again, Perfection is probably not achieved in this lifetime, but we can certainly do better, and that's what we want to talk about. Atmospheric carburizing, let's talk about the atmospheric or corrosion conditions that we're seeing. Obviously, carbon-rich process gases inside the furnace, so we're reducing and diffusing carbon into the surface of the alloys that we select, okay, the metal alloys. We mentioned, I mentioned before, excess uh, combustion air, basically subjects the inside of a radiant tube just by very nature of combustion to oxidizing conditions. Now, in terms of my, just a little bit about how I approach what we're going to be talking about today, I sort of used 1832 or 1000 degrees C as sort of a reference condition to base my comments on. This is probably a little higher uh, than maybe you're operating carburizing at. One of the things that though was that it was very convenient to me because I used as base research material for this presentation the same type of thing you would. I pulled out the alloy uh, materials uh, data sheet. I tried to compare them from this alloy purse manufacturer to this one to that one and tried to sort of put all this data together and I tried to do it in a very visual way. Um, I don't know how you know, an alloy material uh, manufacturer might do it better, but you've got lots of tables of data. And this manufacturer uses, you know, this sort of presentation or uh, table structure, and somebody else presents the information in a different way. And you really sort of got to sit down with all this stuff on your desk and try to, you know, make some semblance of order in your mind about how this stuff works together. So, uh, and a lot of the manufacturers used uh, 1,000 degree centigrade as a sort of a common basis point. So that's one of the reasons I went for this temperature. Let me talk a little bit about um, my use of units because this is a pet peeve with me. I often tell people that I, when I was in grade school, what in about uh, the early 1960s, uh, my weekly reader, do you remember the weekly reader, that little magazine you got in, in what, first or second grade every week? said, when you grow up, it's going to be the metric system, okay? You know, that degree C. Bill St. Thomas from uh, Seco Warwick told a nice little joke the other day. And uh, he said, uh, you know, in, our, in my presentation this morning, I'm going to present you know, the North American, uh, it's not even North American, the, the USA sort of English system units, and then for our European friends and elsewhere in the world, I'm going to present the metric units. Because we in the United States are making a concerted, concerted effort to convert from English and basically progress on to the metric system, and we're doing it one inch at a time. So <laughs> I'm going to, you'll see my, I, I try to basically work with both systems in, uh, of units. So if you're uh, from a country other than the United States or Belize or the Cayman Islands, the three major industrial powers of the world using the English system, you can basically take a look at uh, it from either perspective. So uh, here's some alloys that I encounter when I talk to people uh, what are you using? Okay, so here's the cast out. No, hit the wrong button again. Okay, here's the uh, here's some cast alloys. Okay, and those are probably pretty familiar to most of the people in the room in heat treating. Here are some chemically what do they call it? Chemically similar, compositionally similar type uh, rod alloys uh, used in fabricated components. Okay, uh, these aren't exact. Some of them are very, very close. Okay, and if there's metallurgists in the room, they can uh, talk about that very quickly. We took a look at uh, some of the aluminum precipitated um, 
metallurgy type materials here um, that are fabricated. Um, so there's an alumina precipitate in the metal material so that uh, improves, improves its uh, heat resistance and resistance to our oxidation and carburization in particular. APM, APMT, the T stands for titanium or some additive that's in there. Uh, and we're also, uh, you know, and they probably don't belong in exactly this column, but uh, if you attended uh, the WS presentation next door previously, um, they talked about reaction bonded slip cast silicon carbide and uh, silicon silicon carbide composite is a bit different. This material has a reaction phase. They start with silicon carbide and carbon and they react that with silicon to form a reaction bonded phase, a second reaction bonded phase of silicon carbide in there. So there's two different phases of silicon carbide. Bottom line is there's some silicon left in there as well. Uh, one of the things about high silicon content materials, and this includes both alloys and ceramics, is when you have a significant silicon phase, very effective in providing resistance to uh, carburization, uh, corrosion due to carburization. So, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately in metal alloys it also tends to embrittle the alloys, so they tend to, to limit its, uh, its use as an additive uh, to the alloy, but in the silicon carbide materials, regardless of whether you're talking about this reaction bonded material or uh, silicon, silicon carbide composite material, that silicon is a very effective agent in minimizing uh, corrosion due to carburization. Um, this is about a 50-50 alloy, if you will, a ceramic alloy of silicon and silicon carbide. It's a composite in that it's really a metal matrix with silicon carbide, a metal matrix of silicon containing individual particles of silicon carbide as a reinforcement to that silicon metal. And that's different from uh, this material here, which is predominantly silicon carbide uh, with just some sort of excess uh, silicon left in it from the uh, reaction that takes place. Um, in practice, these materials are very uh, substitutable, very equivalent, I would say, in heat treating, serv and heat treating service, carburization. Um, and I guess the thing you'd really be more concerned about uh, having said that is uh, cost relative to each other. Let's move on. Oxidation resistance. This is the inside of a radiant tube. This is what's happening when your alloy uh, sees uh, air infiltration during loading, unloading. When the work is still hot, you pull it out into the air before you quench or something of this sort. Um, what I found when I started looking at, and this is particularly cast alloys, so here's the legend over here with HK uh, down to HX. So, uh, you know, we're starting at a fairly low, you know, the predominant uh, factor here, uh, most of us would understand is the addition or the nickel content of the materials. Very low here, very high here, okay. Um, but in any case, at the temperatures that we're concerned about in carburization, even with radiant tubes that operate at a higher level than perhaps the baskets or the alloy trays would, um, you know, if we're at 1832, okay, the temperature the belt is saying, the tray is saying, etc., there's not much difference here, okay? Okay, and even if we go up maybe 150 to 200 degrees, okay, where the external temperature the radiant tube is operating at, I'm going to still say there's not too much difference there. My conclusion, you know, perhaps somebody sees it differently and they're free to say so, okay, is, um, you know, first off, oxidation isn't uh, a big issue, okay, it's a secondary tertiary type issue and most of these cast alloys have pretty good oxidation performance. So um, I guess my conclusion at this slide is we can move on and not worry too much about this because as we go along, there's bigger fish to fry, harder problems to deal with. Okay, please, there we go. Carburization dist, uh, resistant, uh, resistance, again, 
This data that I'm showing you is right from the same brochures that the alloy people hand you uh, or, you know, when you're dealing with your alloy fabricator, your caster, whatever, these are the same types. This is the type of information that they would provide you. This is open market information. I'm not, you know, giving you anything special here. Um, so again, same legend, and we see that uh, depending on how the, you know, a general trend here is going to be in, as we move from left to right, okay, is increasing nickel content in these alloys, carburization re, uh, resistance, or in this case we got weight gain over 1,064 hours, that's a bit more than a month, okay, at 1760F, 960 degrees C, more typical probably carburization uh, temperature that you might use in your facility. Over here, uh, I left this in, uh, in metric because it's basically the weight pickup. So we got milligrams uh, weight pickup over a square millimeter, okay? It's their units. I just chose to use them the way they presented them. Um, you know, you can think of it as uh, ounces per square inch or square foot or something like that. That's the type of thing we're dealing with here. And the low nickel alloys, HK over here, uh, you know, 0.55 milligrams per meter squared. The important thing is that's a big number and you get over here and these are, you know, what, one quarter of the amount of carburization weight gain that's occurring in the alloys. These, this is just general alloy data as was the last slide. Again, any sort of, any sort of component you might be using in your carburization furnace um, and uh, at that temperature, okay? So to me, my conclusion, hey, look, there's a significant difference in alloy performance under carburizing conditions. Now, um, one of the decorative components that we have at our booth in the show is a vase, a vase, okay? If you come, you're going to find flowers in our vase. I want you to look at the vase itself and see what happens to alloy in, under extreme carburization, okay? It's a very artistic piece, but it started out life as a radiant tube. Um, it's just a very dramatic example, and if I would have thought ahead, I would have brought it here today and told you that we spent $10,000 to buy this at some art gallery on Park Avenue in New York or something. It's, uh, it's a very interesting piece, but it's an extreme example of what happens due to carburization. So just to sort of put some perspective before we move on and talk about creep, let's talk about you know, maybe what we've learned a little bit or what I've suggested about atmospheric carbur uh, corrosion. And the main issue here is carburization. What does carburization mean? It means that that metal, as the carbon diffuses into the surface, gets, you know, is going to diffuse deeper and deeper over time. That material's in there 24-7 or an awful lot. So that uh, degree of, uh, of case depth, is going to increase and that material is going to embrittle. And as it's subjected to stress, that alloy, that embrittled alloy is eventually going to fail. And that's regardless of whether you put any mechanical load on it at all. And of course, trays, fixtures, belts, these are all subjective, subjected to load stress uh, all the time. So embrittlement is something that we're very concerned about. Oxidation, a lot less of an issue, okay? Uh, I guess if I were, uh, uh, you know, uh, involved in running a heat treating operation, that's something I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about. Uh, but in terms of carburization, these higher nickel alloys, um, you know, regardless of whether we're talking about cast, HU, HW, HX, or sort of the equivalents or near equivalents, not exact, uh, 33, 600, 602, these are all, I would say, reasonable candidates for selection for components uh, inside uh, carburizing furnaces. Uh, unfortunately, as we go from lower to higher nickel contents, and of course there's other alloying 
uh, additives in there for different purposes. Uh, you know, if you were to get into the metallurgy, I'm not a metallurgist, I'm an electrical engineer. I don't, that, that doesn't make me qualified for anything in heat treating except, hey, I can look at data really good. Uh, that's sort of what we do. Uh, so the data basically says, um, the data provided by the manufacturer says to me that these are good alloys, but you know, we all recognize that these are more costly. Uh, MTI, if you see sort of the monthly newsletter, if you, re if you get the Monty, typically you're going to see a commodities chart in there for two metals. One is nickel, okay, which is what we're talking about here. You know, these uh, 60, you get into these 600s, you're up to 60% nickel content. And, uh, you know, nickel is relatively expensive. What's nickel going for right now? Eight, nine bucks? Okay, a pound, okay, and it's, uh, what was it, just a few years ago it was through the roof, it was closer to 25 bucks a pound. It's a commodity, its price varies with the market, and the more nickel you have in there, um, you know, the more of a factor it is. You may get better, oops, that was interesting. Um, let's see here, okay. Uh, more is their higher performance materials. They have higher value to you in terms of service life and what you can basically, how much work you can get out of them. Uh, but you're going to pay a cost material for this. We're all pretty much familiar with this. Okay, and when you basically consider the additional cost of high nickel alloys, you're going to then have the alternative, particularly in terms of radiant tubes, which again are operating at a still higher temperature than your basket. Than your than your uh, than your tray, uh, you're going to have the opportunity uh, to actually look at silicon silicon carbide composites materials for radiant tubes, or again, slip cast materials are very good as well. Tend to be a little bit higher in pricing because of the manufacturing process that's involved there. Let's move on and look at some of the thermal mechanical creep type uh, issues that we experience with these kind of alloys. Okay, and let's just start by looking at, you know, some creep curves. And this is HT cast alloys. Uh, I just picked this one because it's a very common heat treating uh, alloy that's used for all sorts of different components. Uh, again, this is a cast alloy. Uh, if you buy fabricated materials, fabricated baskets, fabricated tubes, you, uh, you might be thinking 330, okay, the raw equivalent or compositionally similar material is 330. And we'll talk a little bit about what that compositionally similar or dissimilar uh, aspect of uh, comparing some of these alloys might be. Okay, so we're looking at HT and there's four curves here and let's just talk a little bit about them. These again are very, these first three are uh, creep stress curves and we're measuring the amount of stress that it takes to deform the material a hundredth of a percent, a thousandth of a percent, one ten thousandth of a percent in just one hour. These are relatively short ter term performance creep uh, curves, okay? So, um, you know, as you might expect uh, to, get, um, to get more uh, creep, okay? A, you know, a higher number here, 0.01 percent, a hundredth of a percent, is more stress, okay? And as we go to a hundredth of a percent, oh, did I get that wrong? No, okay? So I have less def deformation here at a, a hundredth of, at a thousandth of a percent, excuse me, okay? I have this curve here, okay? And then at one ten thousandth of a percent, this very dotted blue line down here that's running pretty close to the red line there, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the point is, with, um, you know, as the amount of creep that were, uh, that's, big, that's basically happening, the stress is increasing, okay? So... Highest stress levels result in the highest deformation. Very sort of intuitive thing. 
than any of us would expect. No great metallurgical type of uh, discovery here. This is really basic. Uh, but that's basically how these curves are put together. Now, some manufacturers will present you with a curve like this. A lot of them, they'll give you tabular data. For me, I'd rather visualize it. Um, and that's why I've sort of taken the approach I have in this presentation. I've already told you, hey, stress in this case is measured in uh, thousands of PSI over here on the left vertical axis for those of us who prefer metric, okay, megapascals over here, the equivalent units uh, in, uh, in metric. Down here, we have degrees Fahrenheit on the upper horizontal scale. We have degrees centigrade here. You can look at this any way you want. Uh, I'll continue to generally talk in degrees Fahrenheit and, uh, and, in, uh, and in English system units uh, because that's the way we do things here. Um, this red curve I didn't talk about yet, and that's basically the rupture curve, okay? And you can see that uh, the curve at which rupture occurs in 10,000 hours, the stress at which that occurs, is very similar to this curve, okay? We got one, we got 10,000 hours long term here. We got one ten thousandths of a percent of deformation in one hour, okay? Um, you know, these curves track very similarly, okay? And you might just start with the idea that, hey, you know, those seem to be pretty well correlated or the curve at 10,000 hours coincides with the curve short term of one ten thousandths of, an, ten thousandths of a percent of def deformation in one hour. And if you actually start going through and reading some of the comments that uh, are in the uh, cast alloy or, the, uh, or in the uh, wrought alloy uh, brochures, you'll find that 1% deformation is typically a level where rupture will occur. So yeah, maybe I'm seeing a coincidence, but it's borne out, I'll say, by the metallurgical perspective of the alloy producers. 1% is basically what does it, okay? Um, so uh, let's move on and take a look at uh, more alloys, okay? And here's a whole bunch of, uh, of cast alloys and uh, we're looking at temperature starting at 1400, excuse me, at 1400 degrees F, okay? And we're looking at the stress levels, um, you know, where uh, in this case where one ten thousandth of a percent of creep occurs short term, one hour, okay? And uh, we have some uh, lower uh, nickel alloys, you know, in the 35% and lower range up here uh, that sort of have these, this set of characteristic curves. Okay, here's some of our higher nickel alloys. Um, you know, this is uh, HW and, uh, and HX here, okay, that have sort of a different, uh, these are 60% range uh, nickel content type alloys that have a, a different characteristic. Uh, the point I see here, you know, is, uh, you know, we're not uh, carburizing, we're not operating at, uh, at 1400 degrees F. Uh, you know, we're up in this range here between 17 and 1800 degrees F and the alloy tubes uh, that are used in, um, in radiant uh, tube service, you know, we're going to be up in this area. And, um, yeah, there's, uh, you can split some hairs there, and some alloys are better than others. Um, but uh, they all have very similar performance. Now, there is a little bit of a delusional aspect to this graph, and that is, if we go back a few slides and we were talking about corrosion and, and due to carburization, uh, some of these alloys, particularly HK, has relatively, and we had the big graph up there with the big red bar on the left, that was HK, and HK has pretty lousy carburization performance. So yeah, it may perform pretty well, okay? Let's just, uh, we got that red square curve and it's coming right here, okay? You know, it's sort of in the middle of the pack maybe, but from a carburization standpoint, 
that alloy is probably going to fail before you ever get to 1% creep. Okay, just because it's going to embrittle and effectively rupture before it has an ever ever has a chance to get to a old age, if you will, at this kind of at this kind of service. So when you look at creep curves, okay, they're probably done in an air atmosphere or something of the sort. When the alloy manufacturer uh, basically does that type of properties test, and you probably want to step back and say, hey. Yeah, I got creep alloy, I got creep property information here, but are the atmospheric conditions really relevant to what I'm doing in my carburizing furnace? In terms of HK, my answer is no, it isn't. Uh, the other thing we looked at was, uh, you know, and this data was a little harder to, uh, to analyze because uh, they, they sort of look at it from a real different perspective, but we did find some uh, APM and APMT data for uh, one ten thousandths uh, of an hour, one ten thousandth of a percent per hour type of uh, uh, performance. Uh, these alloys have great carburizing performance, great oxidizing performance, um, but, um, but they're just not very good on creep. And one of the things that you'll see uh, with some of these, I'll say, advanced metal alloys is you don't really even have to look at the creep data. You can just look at the application notes and they say, well, you really shouldn't, you know, uh, from a beam perspective, you need to support that material with hangers every four feet. Um, I don't have it here, but uh, we have, uh, I've had discussions with a, uh, an aluminum holding application completely different from carburizing, uh, primary aluminum holding application, and you can see where the alloy has, you know, these every four foot, you know, every meter type of, uh, of uh, hanger structures, and then you see the alloy drooped in between them. I mean, that's great in terms of its ability to stand up to the corrosion issues in the environment, but uh, it deforms a good bit, and if you can tolerate that, uh, as they do in aluminum holding, um, that's okay. But, uh, boy, I wouldn't suggest it in carburizing, you know, just because of the temperatures that we get, and, you know, you just usually can't afford to have that much uh, deformation in your materials, particularly if you're talking about trays, you know, belt materials, these alloys just aren't used for, uh, for any of these uh, applications due to the deformation that you see. Now, the other thing we did is we tried to look side by side at uh, these compositionally similar cast versus wrought materials, okay? And uh, I was a little surprised here, or let's just say I learned something, okay? So here, are, oh, come on. Let's see. Okay, so here are the cast alloys, you know, with the same uh, uh, legend uh, symbols that we've used in the previous charts. And now I've added compositionally similar materials. HK, so we're looking at 310. Again, the same creep rate at 1 ten thousandths uh, per hour. Okay, HT and 330, those are pretty close. Okay, HU and 333, pretty close. Okay, but you know, if you look at these compositionally similar wrought materials compared to their cast similar materials, um, the amount of stress that it takes to achieve this level of deformation short term is much lower. You know, some cases a third, okay? And again, I've almost in the previous slide, you know, sort of written off HK altogether because of its low carburization resistance. But even these others, you know, it's uh, typically maybe no more than the wrought alloy's performance under, uh, under high temperature creep is, uh, is no more than half of what, the, uh, of what the cast materials are. And again, if you sort of really study the manufacturer's literature again, some of them, you know, particularly the cast people, of course, will tell you why, okay? And of course, your wrought materials you know, your fabricator, you know, they're going to bend a bar for the tray. Uh, they're going to uh, roll 
the alloy for a tube, you know, and probably be involved with welding the material. But these materials need to be relatively formable, okay? Um, so the carbon content of these compositionally similar alloys may be only about 2.2%, whereas when the people, when the cast folks are basically fabricating the component to shape, okay, say casting a tray, okay, they can basically manipulate the carbon content um, in the pore so that they end up with something closer to 0.5, 0.6%. Now, what may happen during, uh, you know, uh, time use in the time when it's in carburizing is that your carbon from your uh, process is going to basically diffuse uh, deeper and deeper into these wrought alloys and they will probably come up a bit, okay? Uh, another thing that the cast manufacturers will talk about is their ability to manipulate carbon content. And this might be something you want to talk about if you're using uh, cast tray alloys or cast radiant tubes or something of the sort. Um, high temperature alloy creep curve. So now here we're looking at uh, HWHX601. Uh, excuse me, 602, okay, same sort of uh, creep performance, um, short term, and uh, 602, you know, is, is a lot closer to, uh, to, the, uh, to the HW and HX sort of cast type materials. Okay, so these alloys are higher temperature alloys, they're more resistant to carburization and oxidation, the data I saw basically though says that they are actually more prone to creep. And uh, we already talked about uh, the APM alloys being very creep prone and needing to be supported every meter or every uh, oh, three, four feet. Okay, now we're getting to long term or essentially creep rupture type data at 10,000 hours. Again, something like 1.4 years. And here's a whole slew of different alloys over here in the legend, okay? Same sort of legends used previous in the previous slides. Uh, the point here would be at relatively lower temperatures, uh, below carburizing process, uh, you know, you have some scatter and some uh, difference in alloy performance. As you get up here, uh, you know, to these higher temperature levels that might be, that are that are more, uh, you know, appropriate for carburizing, more relevant, okay? You're seeing less dispersion in their performance. And as you get up here to radiant tubes, boy, they're almost all sort of, you know, coming in at the same uh, creep performance, creep rupture performance. So uh, what I got to do now is just sort of take a look and we'll focus in on this level, this level here in a couple of slides, but before that, I really haven't given you any data for uh, for ceramic materials, for silicon silicon carbide materials, and um, well, I still haven't given you any data. I've given you a picture. Okay, this is uh, 600 alloy after an hour at uh, oh, excuse me. I need to take button coordination lessons or something. I think I just haven't got my hang of this. Uh, and I apologize. But uh, 600 alloy here on the right, okay, after just an hour at 2462, really an extreme temperature, um, you know, that's the kind of deformation that you're seeing. What you're, you know, this came right out of the furnace, that's what you're seeing. Okay, 360 hours under the same condition. This is silicon, silicon carbide material, the, the composite metal matrix composite. Okay, um, so we have a metal matrix of silicon reinforced by silicon carbide particles, and you can see it stands up very nicely under these very extreme conditions for, you know, a pretty long period of time versus 600 alloy. Um, measuring creep performance of advanced ceramic materials is actually a very difficult thing to do because they stand up under these conditions so well. 
Um, one of the things that we're looking forward to, we have a relationship with uh, Alfred University, which is one of the main, you know, some people would say the leading ceramic school in the country. And they have just received funding for a high temperature properties laboratory, four million bucks. So we're hoping that we might actually get some real numerical type data that we could plot on the same chart or I'd sort of expect that our data would be up here. That's on the ceiling, by the way. Okay, so let's get back to the metal alloys. And now I've blown up the lower right corner of that previous slide that we've seen and, and tried to get at, you know, sort of, well, you know, how much uh, difference in alloy performance do we see? And just looking at the, you know, the whole family of different alloys that we've uh, been exploring so far, you know, at uh, 1832, you know, we're seeing a range of what, about uh, 500 PSI or 0.5 kPSI to about uh, 1.6 kPSI, 1600 PSI, okay, well, 500 to 1600, I actually did my homework. Um, and then at uh, temperatures, let's say, um, you know, a couple, you know, so we're up, at, let's say, at 2,000 degrees F, which might be the surface radiating temperature of a radiant tube. Uh, we're seeing that we're down as, uh, some of the materials are down as low as 200 uh, PSI to, you know, somewhere maybe 700 PSI or something of that sort. So depending on whether you're dealing with trays or fixtures or baskets, you might see some, pr some significant differences here. Okay, that help you, uh, you know, make a selection between alloys that perform better at what cost versus alloys that perform not so well but at a lesser value, uh, but at a lesser price, and make a decision that's right, optimum for your operation. Uh, in radiant tubes, uh, there's a lot less difference, different uh, difference in the uh, material performance, and. Uh, and the stress levels are a lot lower, you know, compared to what they are, you know, for tray fixture belt performance versus, again, radiant tube performance. Okay, uh, this is a very busy slide, but what we, and I, I probably should have taken some of these materials, uh, some of these structures out of here. And so now we're looking at structures. We're looking at tubes as beams, okay? So, uh, you know, those of you who are mechanical engineers and, you know, went and go do your structural type calculations, that's what we're doing here. And we're looking at all sorts of different diameters that are used for metal alloys and uh, the typical type of comparable um, structures uh, used in uh, tubular materials for radiant tubes. So. These are, uh, and forgive me, I, I threw our company name up there. I guess I wasn't supposed to do that quite yet. Uh, but these are silicon, silicon carbide composite materials. Um, there's two things that are happening here. One thing is these materials are one-third lighter than their metal equivalents, okay? The specific gravity of a silicon, uh, silicon carbide composite is about 35% typically of what these nickel alloys are, okay? It's a lot lighter because it's a lot lighter when you build the bridge, okay? There's a lot less weight, weight in the bridge structure itself and therefore less stress, okay? So these are horizontal beam structures, uniform load, and these again are typical radiant tube uh, sizes. And of course, uh, the amount of stress depends on the length. And this is sort of an inverse scale down here at the bottom from a 120 inch beam structure to something that's very short, okay? So there's very little stress on a, on a short bridge, on a very long bridge, there's a lot of stress, okay? That all fits very intuitively with, with, with what we'd think. Um, and what this basically shows is that because Silicon, silicon carbide is such a lighter material, okay, uh, no matter what the length is, or in this case, even what the diameter is, these silicon, silicon carbide materials have a lot less stress on them 
and this is one of the factors why you don't see as much deformation with silicon silicon carbide materials. I'm going to say there's really two issues. One is the one we looked at up front in terms of carburization, the degree, the amount of silicon uh, in the composite basically means it's not going to um, see any detrimental effect due to carbon diffusion or carburization. So that's one reason why they would perform, why they do perform much better in uh, carburization service. And the other factor is, uh, is that they're one third lighter just by virtue of the specific gravity of the material. So put those two factors together and in terms of mechanical, thermal mechanical stress and in terms of corrosion performance, the silicon silicon carbide materials would tend to last indefinitely. Well, um, so again, you know, heading into the, uh, into the home stretch here, um, unfortunately, the world isn't perfect and we're always dealing with trade-offs. We're balancing cost against service life in trays, in belts, in radiant tubes. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing in the data uh, for, these vari for various alloys is you know, there's a big trade-off in terms of carburization versus creep, okay? Things that are very good in terms of carburization re resistance are only good to fair, okay, in terms of creep performance, whether we're talking about creep stress, uh, deformation, or rupture, okay? So the question really becomes, which problem is most critical in your process? what is the limiting factor today for your process as it is, okay? If you're seeing a lot of, you know, rupture, then you've got to sort of take a look at, hey, you know, what kind of alloy am I using? Am I using an alloy with low carburization resistance? Uh, you may want to, to look at improving that aspect of it, but if you go, if your issue actually tends to be more thermal mechanical stress, then you may want to stay away from some of the high nickel materials that are actually more creep prone. Uh, and some of the advanced uh, alloys actually require, as I've suggested, intermediate hangers, you know, every 48 inches. Um, silicon, silicon carbide, regardless of which type we're talking about, the composite or the reaction bonded materials have excellent corrosion and creep properties, okay? There are cost differences, as in the nickel alloys, the more nickel, typically the more costly the alloy, okay? Uh, in this case, uh, the slip cast reaction bonded material is produced in a different, more expensive way, so there's some pricing difference, uh, you know, in procuring those materials. Um, I won't avoid uh, uh, the white elephant, if you will, for, uh, for the ceramic materials, you know, we all picked up, you know, if you were out in the hallway this morning and you picked up one of those china cups to put your coffee in instead of the paper one, if you were to take that china cup and squeeze it, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to deform, okay? Um, you know, it's really strong material, okay? But what you will find, what we all know, is if you drop it on a hard surface, you know, the carpet might have some resiliency to absorb energy, but if you drop it on a hard surface, it breaks. Ceramic materials, by their very nature, have, from a property perspective, low fracture toughness. They're brittle materials. Put away your hammer. Don't install them with a forklift. Shop practice with these materials is important. If your folks basically learn how to work with the materials. I'm going to say work with them this, with the same sort of perspective that you work with glass, okay? Uh, the people that install these uh, fluorescent tubes up here don't break many of them because they've learned how to work with them. The same perspective has to be essentially taught and learned in training in the culture of your organization in dealing with these kind of materials. But having said that, it's really not that hard. Once they're installed, they last indefinitely. What do I mean by indefinitely? Forever unless you break it, okay? So, again, you know, uh, do we have a motivation for change? 
Uh, I think regardless of whether we're talking about trays or belts, you know, these are all components that fail in a short number of years. Alloy selection is important. In some of the uh, applications like radiant tubes, you have the uh, opportunity to use uh, advanced ceramic materials, uh, incorporating silicon and silicon carbide that just have excellent performance for that type of higher temperature that you're seeing, you know, even above the process temperature for carburization. And uh, this, is, uh, this is me and where you can find me if you have a questions after the presentations, and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions now.